Please help me welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you all, and uh, uh, it's great to be in New York City for the first time, I believe, at a GFA, I think. Uh, uh, so um, I'm going to get right to the point. Um, there was a, a very important moment in my playing career that happened 40 years ago. And 40 years ago, I was uh, preparing a program uh, for a concert at Pomona College. That included the entire uh, suite by Bach uh, 1006, the, the one that's also a violin partita. Uh, so that's a challenging, uh, uh, substantial piece right there. And then in addition to that, I was going to be playing on the second half the uh, 12 Villalobos Etudes. Uh, so I thought, well, that's kind of a heavy program, right? Uh, it's going to be a pretty serious challenge. And um, I thought, well, I'd need 10 more minutes. I just need 10 more minutes of music. And so I thought, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn four of the uh, Pavans by Luis Milan. And um, I thought, those are pretty easy pieces. You know, somebody who's able to play the Bach Suite 1006, able to play the uh, Villalobos Etudes, should have no problem whatsoever with these uh, little Milan Pavans. So, as I was learning these pieces and practicing them, I was sort of astounded. Um, they didn't seem as easy as I thought they should be. And uh, part of the problem was that I could play the notes. It wasn't a problem. You know, much of it was just you know, C chords, you know, just first position chords and things like that. But I had musical concepts that I felt like I couldn't fully uh, uh, resolve. I couldn't fully uh, produce what I wanted to hear in the, in the, in the pieces. After the concert, um, which went pretty well, I uh, was perplexed as to what the problem was. And um, I set about that following summer to uh, uh, embark on a recording project. The recording project was uh, that I wanted to record the first Milan Pavan and figure out what it needed to be able to uh, sound the way I wanted it to sound. So um, a friend of mine who I was living with had a really great uh, recording system, professional quality with professional microphones, and he was gone for the summer. So um, sometimes for an hour a day, uh, I would make uh, maybe 20 takes of this silly little minute-long pavan by Louis Milan trying to get the, the character and the sound that I wanted. And I was uh, completely uh, uh, unhappy with everything that I produced. I mean, if you were to listen to those takes, you go, wow, he's hitting all the notes, sounds good, musical, all this kind of stuff. But there are certain little uh, issues that I felt uh, weren't the way I wanted. And um, after probably maybe 30 days of recording, this one little minute long piece, uh, I gave up because I realized that I wasn't getting the result that I wanted. And that um, uh, created a lot of uh, uh, personal introspection in terms of my playing because I knew that something was not the way I wanted it to be. Uh, so I'm going to leave that for a second. I'm going to go back even farther in time to um, a situation where I was uh, with uh, a girlfriend at the time who was a very fine violist. And just for fun, I asked her to show me how to play the viola. And so she told me how to hold the, the, the viola with the left arm and how to hold the bow. And then she said, OK, relax your right arm. And I said, I am relaxed. She goes, no, you're not. <laughs> and we just kind of let it go. And it dawned on me that. It was obvious to her that I was not relaxed, but clueless to myself. I had no idea what that meant. Uh, I thought I was relaxed, but I wasn't. Um, so uh, with those two stories in mind, uh, let's get to some nitty gritty things. <clears throat> what does it mean to be a relaxed player? Um, it doesn't mean that you're just this slug who just uses no muscles and, <laughs> and plays beautifully. 
Uh, it means that you're using the muscles you want without the interference of other muscles. Okay? Uh, let me show you what it should not feel like to play the guitar. Take a hand and make like an eagle claw. All right? Uh, when you make an eagle claw like this, or bird of prey claw, you've pulled all the muscles on both sides of your arm. They're, they're, they're fighting each other. It's what we would call co-contraction. Now, if that's how you play with both hands, um, you're going to have problems, or you might have problems. Uh, some people play all their lives with hands that look like this, uh, or even maybe not quite so bad, but they might even look just like this. And they have co-contraction, and they have no problems, and, and sometimes they often will play beautifully. Uh, but for a lot of people, that can lead to hand injuries, and then they have to pay big bucks to come see me to fix them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, wasn't, I, would, I wouldn't say that I was really extreme, but I knew that the way that I played um, uh, felt tight, okay? And after I would practice for maybe three hours, I would feel kind of sore and physically tired. Uh, when I would play a concert, even though the results were good, um, after the concert, I felt like I'd been in a boxing match. I mean, I just felt physically uh, drained, like, like I'd worked really hard. And uh, so with, um, with that, I had to try to figure out what it meant to uh, be a relaxed guitarist. And uh, fortunately, I'm not the only person in the world who's figured this out, but I'd like to share with you uh, some of the thoughts that I have come up with. Um, <laughs> I have another funny little story that is kind of important and I'm going to tie it into everything else. Uh, I had, uh, I've had some really fantastic students over the years. And this one girl, I don't know if you've seen her videos on YouTube, but her name is Jennifer Kim. Uh, she studied with me from uh, just before the age of 10 up until she went to college. Uh, so it was about 10 years. And um, uh, there was uh, a time where she was working on the first Villalobos etude. And uh, I realized that uh, there was like no way in the world I was going to pull out my guitar uh, during a lesson and try to demonstrate anything for her because she, she could just play a million miles an hour and, and it was totally in control and stuff. And um, uh, what I had, I hadn't touched the, the Villalobos etude in a long time, uh, probably not since those concerts in 83. Uh, and I realized that... Um, I had traumatized the piece. Now, what does it mean to traumatize a piece? What it means is that you've practiced it in, in a very wrong way, with the wrong muscles, and you've probably practiced it like a maniac, like I did. And when I was in college and learning the first Villalobos etude, I remember putting on a Chris Parkening album with my metronome and trying to figure out what uh, speed he was playing at, and I was just driven to play it at that speed. And so this minute and a half long piece, I would spend you know, an hour a day practicing, right? <laughs> and uh, it was all practicing with way too much uh, muscle tension in my shoulders, my back, my forearm. And you know, it got better and better and better, but it never felt good at all. And I felt like to play in a concert, I was just hanging on for dear life. And so after not playing the piece for a long time, even though my playing had improved in terms of muscle control and whatnot. Um, by association, anytime I tried to play that piece, I was in trouble. So, so when Jennifer would come to the lesson with that piece, I had to just leave the guitar in the case. Don't touch it. <laughs> and so um, um, the point of that story is that when you first start working on a piece, whether you realize it or not, your brain is in memory mode you have sort of hit a button in your brain that says, remember all of this. And not only will your brain hopefully remember your left hand fingerings and your right hand fingerings, but um, it's going to remember how it felt when you played. I don't know how many times I've had students play a scale where they'll, like the Segovia C major scale, where they'll play it for me maybe a few weeks after I introduce it to them, and they'll do something like this. them, 
why did you look at your right hand during the shift? And they're like, what? And they'll do it every single time. You know, I might have them play the scale three or four times, and every single time that they play the scale, they move their head to look at their right hand for no reason whatsoever, but it's a trained response. If you do something you know, twice when you learn a piece, it's, it's cast in stone uh, forever, unless you willfully change it. So, um, when I learned that Villalobos etude, I practiced it with so much muscle tension, kind of co-contraction, that even though I kind of fought like a maniac to, to play the piece, and, and you know, it probably went okay, um, uh, at a certain point, I couldn't touch that piece without immediately having the same sensation in my arms. And so, uh, um, one of the ways that I uh, got around that, and I actually now can almost play the piece, um, is uh, I've had people come to me who have been uh, fighting focal dystonia. I don't know if you know what focal dystonia is. It's, um, it's something that is devastating to a musician. It means that you're, you're basically your, uh, your uh, musical um, uh, abilities have, you've lost control of them. And usually for guitarists, it's their right hand. I've worked with uh, two people who had focal dystonia with their left hand who literally couldn't play a single note. Uh, usually with the right hand, it uh, starts off with spasming and then all of a sudden uh, uh, they can't do anything. Um, and so the, the problem with um, uh, focal dystonia is you've, uh, people who have developed that try to fix it themselves and when they try to fix them themselves, they actually try to tighten up more to control their fingers and it's this downward spiral. And I found that um, uh, one of the pieces that often uh, prompts or encourages people to go down that uh, rabbit hole into focal dystonia land is uh, Villalobos Etude 1. <laughs> and so there's a few people who I've worked with uh, who, have folk, who had focal dystonia, and uh, I made huge inroads with them by tackling that very piece. And in doing so, I actually kind of helped myself as well. All right, so those, that, that's it for the stories. Let's talk about some uh, nuts and bolts things. Um, I've started um, formulating this idea about using what I call passive and active motion when you play the guitar. Uh, if you open up either hand like this, just kind of flatten out your hand, you'll feel that it takes a little strain to open up your hand, right? Uh, so I'm gonna call that active motion. If you let go of your left hand, or either hand, what happens? It moves. I'm gonna call that passive motion. And passive motion is this gold mine of, of a resource that you have. And um, if you can um, in, um, discover ways of involving passive motion in your playing, you'll find that uh, it's gonna be, uh, you, you're gonna feel like you can play pieces with ease, you're going to feel like you're not fighting the piece, and your enjoyment and musical abilities are going to skyrocket. And so, um, uh, with the left hand, uh, one of the things that I often have people do is uh, I'll have them uh, uh, open up their hand and then put their fingers on a chord. Let's say, let's say a C chord. Open up your hand, release, and when you release, you just want to fall to the C chord. Now, of course, you don't do this in the context of a piece, but uh, what that teaches you to do is the idea of sort of a controlled fall to the strings. And then let's say the piece I was going to play had to uh, involve a D chord. Now, there's no connecting fingers with that, those two chords, so what I might have them do is like I just have them open up their hand, release to the C chord, and then open up the hand, release to the D chord. And then when you, I'll have them squeeze the chord. So let's say you uh, touch the, the, the C chord, squeeze the chord a little bit, and then when you release, just fall onto the D chord. You saw how quickly I went from the C chord to the D chord. When I um, troubleshoot uh, uh, people who uh, come to me to work on their playing, uh, I sort of have this uh, uh, rule of one that I call it. 
the rule of one is that ideally, for any motion that you make playing the guitar, you want to have one motion. If I go like this, let's say I play the C chord, I go C chord, lift, D chord. That's two motions, right? Uh, if I go like this, I go C chord, release to D, it was a straight shot. It's like the, 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 the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, right? So if I go up and then down, that's not a straight line. If I go sort of sideways, uh, like that, that's going to be the most efficient way. So uh, uh, let's t continue on with the left hand. Uh, so let's say I was learning a new piece. Uh, uh, a couple, in fact, the last concert I played at Pomona College, I've actually uh, uh, stopped teaching at Pomona a year ago, May. Uh, the LA freeways got to me. After 42 years, I finally said I've had enough and I quit. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I love teaching. I love teaching at Pomona College. It was a great school to be affiliated with. I take great pride in the fact that I taught at a school for 42 years that never would have allowed me in as a student. <laughs> Um, and um, uh, so, where was I? So, uh, uh, when I learn a new piece, uh, oh, I was getting back to uh, 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 the last performance I gave at Pomona right before the pandemic. Um, I played the uh, Takemitsu Concerto uh, 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 to the edge of dream. And uh, I only had four months to learn this piece. And I don't know if you're aware of this piece, but it's, uh, if you've played anything by Takamitsu, uh, uh, be forewarned, the left hand is insane. Uh, the right hand's not <clears throat> usually too bad, but the left hand stretches and chord changes are just uh, crazy. Uh, and so I knew that from looking at it from day one that I needed to be really careful. Not only did I need to learn this piece efficiently, but I needed to learn it without killing my left hand. And um, uh, those two things are tied together in my approach. And so what I would do is, um, when I would practice that piece, I would sort of think in terms of what I call a cell. Um, you can call it anything you want, but a cell is just a, a minute amount of music, whether it's a measure, whether it's a beat, whether it's a half a beat, doesn't matter. It's a chunk of music that you want to feel like, okay, I'm in control of this passage or this event. And what I have as a rule is that I don't want to carry over anything like fatigue, strain, stress, or bad juju, whatever. I don't want to carry anything over from one event into the next. Because then you're going to compound your problem if you've done that. If you get three measures into the piece and your hand's already tired, you're in trouble, okay? So I decided from the very first moment that I was gonna learn this piece very carefully. I was aware from kind of looking through it a little bit that uh, it was a severe, severe uh, challenge for the left hand with crazy stretch stretches and chord shapes that I'd never seen before in any piece. Uh, Takemitsu had a really unique language. Uh, and so what I did was I made sure that Every chord switch, every measure, every event, every cell, I felt 100% in control of. And what that would mean would be, I'm just going to make something up. Let's say I had a chord like this. Okay? And then the next chord might be this. Okay? And they're supposed to go beep, bump, right? And so when I would practice it, I'd sit here, I'd relax my hand, always start with the highest finger first, pull back. Play it, release. If I needed to shake it out, take five minutes, go have a cup of green tea or something, probably chamomile tea, then play the next chord, great. So over the days, maybe at, on the first day I might take five seconds between the first chord and, next sec, uh, and the second chord, and I needed to like shake my hand out, rejuvenate my hand, because I don't want to carry that fatigue over from one thing to the next. And then on day two, maybe it took me four seconds. Maybe on day three, it took me three seconds to recover, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, as a result, uh, you'll find that you can learn pieces much more quickly this way 
if it feels good on day one. That's your objective, is to feel great playing that piece on the very first day. If it takes you 15 minutes to play one measure, but you feel great, that's success, all right? If you feel like you're fighting that first measure and you play through it at, at you know, half tempo, you're in trouble because you have learned, you have taught your brain to remember that. Your brain will remember that sensation and will associate that feeling with the playing of those chords and it will be almost impossible to get rid of it once you've done that. So, um, so on day one, when you learn a new piece, you have to make sure that it feels great. Uh, if you'll bear with me, I'll tell you another quick story. I remember the first day that I sat down to practice the Sonatina by uh, Torova. And I can remember it being in a practice room in college, the exact practice room. And I remember thinking, uh, I, I kind of fought my way through the first movement, figured out fingerings and notes and rhythms and this and that. And I literally said to myself, quote, that was brutal. But it'll get better. Now, I practiced the piece really hard, and yes, it did get better. Played it in recitals and um, cycled it, meaning like I, I would play it for a couple of concerts, drop it for a few years, pick it up again, play it again. And, you know, it always got better, but it never felt great. It always felt like it did kind of when I first learned it. And somehow in the back of my mind, I kind of imagined that there was a button that you push, and you push that button, it's like, presto, now it feels like John Williams. Okay? When I watch John Williams play, I'm amazed because I'm sure it's the same with you. It doesn't matter what he plays, it looks easy. It looks, well, I would pretty much guarantee you that if it looks like that, it probably feels like that. Okay? And one of the other things that I've discovered and uh, this was quite interesting yesterday and, and Monday because I was a judge uh, for the International Artist Competition. And so we listened to, I think, 61 or 62 competitors. And um, uh, even the absolute best, I can hear what they feel. Once you become sensitive to what is involved with the, how it feels to play a musical instrument, you can tell. You can hear the way they release chords, the, their right hand tone. And so you can hear what they feel. Uh, uh, the first time I saw Julian Bream play, I have to tell you, Julian Bream was my hero, and still is. Loved everything about Julian Bream. Uh, one of the greatest moments of my life was playing for him in a master class in the San Francisco Conservatory. And then another great moment was having drinks with him after a concert. That was, that was a riot. Uh, funniest man alive. Um, but um, it was torture to watch him play. I mean, I remember the last time I saw him play, he played the Chaconne. And I'm just like, oh, please, God, please, God, let him get through this piece. I was just praying that he would survive the piece. And, you know, I loved his playing. But it was torture to watch him play because I could hear and feel everything that he was feeling. Um, and how he played as well as he did on recordings and stuff. And one time I saw him play a concert where he, he was just on. He played great. But the other times it was, it, was, it was rough. It was hard to hear him play and enjoy it. But um, so uh, let's get back to things. Um, all right. So I think you understand the idea about like practicing left-hand cells. Does anybody have any questions thus far? Yes. So when you talk about... Um controlling tension in a very rational way. Um, what are some suggestions that you might have for stressful moments, such as competitions or concerts, where your sort of fight or flight reaction takes place? What, uh, what do you rec recommend as sort of an antidote to that? Yeah. Great question. OK, so uh, if you practice relaxing with a piece, first of all, you're going to get much better control. Uh, and you're going to have done what? You're going to have practiced relaxing. Okay, so um, one of the things that becomes uh, really important when you perform, in my opinion, uh, is that um, you have things that you can rely on that you've, you've done uh, that you can uh, sort of engage at, at that moment. Uh, when I walk out on stage uh, for a concert, I walk to the center of the stage, bow to the two or three people that are in the, in the audience, <laughs> uh, sit down, 
And the first thing, this is not a joke. I actually say to myself, right elbow flop. And so what does that mean? Well, your elbow is bone, right? <laughs> uh, so it's not a muscle. But I just tell myself, right elbow flop. And my right elbow, if it, if it feels like it's falling back like that, uh, then I feel the weight of my arm on the guitar. These are some just punched things that I, that I find. Uh, and then um, I want to feel gravity. I want to feel gravity. I want to feel like the weight of my arms are being held up by the guitar. I want to feel, let's say, just to throw out a number, each of my arms weighs 12 pounds. So that's 24 pounds three pounds for the guitar. I want to feel 25 pounds or close to it on my left leg. So I want to feel all the weight there. Uh, whether you use a footstool, a, uh, some kind of A-frame or whatever, doesn't matter. You still want to feel that weight there. Uh, so another one of my axioms is don't resist gravity. So when you see people play that are like this, they're up in the air. Their right arms, their elbows up, uh, their wrist probably goes in. Uh, they're, they're not using the weight of the left arm to help, and so on and so forth. Okay? So um, the other thing is um, I'm big on trying to incorporate the structure of the body to help. So we have this thing called the skeletal, sy skeletal system. <clears throat> the skeletal system, if we didn't have it, we'd be uh, slugs, right? Uh, and so we want to try to use the, 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 the uh, your spinal column to support as much of the uh, uh, weight of your uh, upper body as possible. Uh, I don't know if you realize this, but if you ever go play, uh, if you ever go bowling, the bowling ball that you take from, uh, unless you have your own, um, is probably going to be about the weight of your head. So, uh, so for some people like me who have big heads, heavy heads, I take a 20 pound bowling ball. Uh, but uh, your head is very heavy and we don't realize it, uh, but if you drop your head, all of a sudden you engage all these back muscles and uh, abdomen muscles, chest muscles, shoulder muscles to hold your head up. And so you wanna uh, pay attention to that. Uh, and so using the structure of your body to sit properly uh, has uh, incredible benefits. I like to uh, w work with my students and tell them that I want their elbows, hips, and shoulders to be as close to alignment as possible. So when you see something like this, their right elbows forward, their left elbows back, they're not aligned with their hips and their shoulders. So one of the things that you can do when you're at home practicing is sit facing straight ahead, get your back nice and straight, Pretend you're playing a small ukulele, like this. Okay, that's your goal. You want it to feel that easy. Now, of course, the guitar isn't that small, and you have to do some uh, modifications to this. But you notice that um, with the left hand, our left hand's usually farther in front than our right. You don't want it the opposite, because if you do that, then all of a sudden you involve twisting your body, uh, shoulders, neck everything gets out of whack. Your muscles kind of work as teams. You don't just engage one muscle when you do anything. So if I go like this, there's probably <laughs> uh, half the muscles in my body are engaged. In fact, probably more than that, because when I go like this, all of a sudden I can feel it in my right foot. <laughs> so it's amazing how our bodies work. Um, and when we're trying to play the guitar, there's a lot of activity that has to go on in your arm muscles. And if you have shoulder muscles, back muscles, neck muscles, uh, leg muscles, you're lifting up with your feet and all sorts of crazy stuff, then um, you're going to uh, uh, impact your finger muscles. So, uh, does that help? Yes, very much. Okay. Uh, since you asked that question, I'm going to uh, veer off on another uh, thing related to what you just said. And I'm going to tell you another story. Uh, so, uh, in 1985, I played a concert for the biggest audience I had until then played for. It was about 800 people. And it was a concert that was at uh, the colleges where I taught, uh, the Claremont Colleges. And it was, uh, the focus of the uh, concert was a lecture about Spain. And uh, they asked me if I would come in and play a half hour of Spanish guitar music. And so um, I, I played the uh, uh, Turina, uh, um, what's it called? 
uh, s uh, uh, wait, wait, that's not right. Van de Giel. Van de Giel, thank you. The, the, the Van de Giel by Turina, which is a challenging piece. Uh, the full sonatina by uh, Toroba, all three movements. Uh, Asturias, and maybe something else. And um, uh, when I walked out and saw that, that the hall was completely full, which sat 800, uh, it was like, wow, OK, this is a new experience. And um, fortunately, the concert, concert went well. But uh, at that half hour uh, program, I uh, literally became the most religious person on the planet. Um, I'm not kidding. I was, I was like, dear God, let me get through this. Dear God, don't let me screw up. Dear God, let me hang on, OK? Uh, and um, uh, so not only did I have you know, tension issues that I was fighting with, but you know, I had like you know, um, thunderbolts going on through my brain, and, and it was short-circuiting like crazy. Um, fortunately, I did pretty well, but I came away from that concert feeling um, uh, really empty, like something, something's not right there, too. Uh, so not only did this not feel great, but this did, wasn't good either. And uh, soon after, I was teaching at Pomona, and I was uh, um, making up lessons, so I was in a different room. I was in a piano faculty room, and one of the piano teachers had um, photocopied an article by Gina Bachauer, who was a great Italian pianist. And Gina Bachauer, uh, in this article, talked about how to deal with nerves and sort of the mental side of playing. And uh, she talked about how, yeah, with nerves, um, if you think about it, then you're going to make it worse because you're thinking about it. So you have to just accept it and just say that's part of the deal. Anybody who plays a concert should be nervous and will be nervous. If they're not, they're, they're, they're lying to you. Um, uh, secondly. What is it that, that needs to be going on in your brain when you uh, perform? Well, it's really quite simple. When you practice, <clears throat> just like when you teach your fingers, OK, I want to play this note, this note, this note. I want to play it with this right hand. I want to do it with this rhythm, this sound, um, uh, this color, so on and so forth. You need to have a thought that happens the same every time you play that passage. Now, what happens to us when we play, when we learn a piece is we typically are very focused when we first start practicing a piece because we have to figure out what the notes are, the rhythms, the fingerings, and all that stuff, right? So our concentration usually is really good. Then after a while, we start, we have the piece memorized perhaps, and we start playing it better, and we start thinking, our brain starts living in la-la land, and we start thinking about, gee, I really want to go to the beach tomorrow, and I, you know, you're playing this piece, and you're thinking about who knows what, OK? And maybe you make a mistake, and you go, oh, I'll fix that, and then you go on. <clears throat> and so what happens over time is the longer you play a piece, probably the, the, the more downhill your concentration goes, because you've sort of relied on muscle memory. And then when the moment of the truth happens, and you have to perform it for somebody, you don't know what to think about. So you start thinking horrible thoughts. It's like, oh, I hope I don't screw up. Oh, so-and-so is in the audience. Oh, my god. It's going to be, what, what does that person think of my playing? Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, you start thinking all these horrible things, negative things. So <clears throat> next time you practice a piece, what I want you to do is I want you to think, OK, uh, I need to play an A minor chord. Oops. Ha ha. Wrong strings. And then next thing I want to do is an E major chord, short E major chord, A minor. So you want to visualize those specific motions that you're going to repeat every time you play the piece. Okay. So when you practice playing a piece, after the first, say, few weeks or whatever, don't think that you're practicing it for your fingers. Practice it for your brain. Practice thinking when you practice. If I have a concert coming up, and let's say I've had a really, back, especially when I was teaching at Pomona, um, I come back home, maybe it was 9 o'clock at night, I'm exhausted, but I've got to practice. Okay? And if I was too tired to practice such that I couldn't keep my focus, um, I would either just do little licks or I just do technique. Because I don't want to screw up my thinking that I had rehearsed for each piece. Getting back to your uh, question. 
So when you perform, if you know what to think about at every single moment of the piece, and you've rehearsed those thoughts, you'll do great. Okay? So the whole key to performing is knowing what to think about and having control of your, your fingers. Okay? And not fighting being nervous, sort of accepting it. But it's tough. That's one of the great challenges. Okay? Um, I find that um, with good concentration uh, practice and, and good you know, technical control of my, my hands, uh, I enjoy playing way more than I ever did before. Uh, I remember playing a concert one time where my left leg was like shaking so bad the guitar was like bouncing, you know. Uh, I mean, that still might happen, but I know how to sort of just release things and, and it helps enormously. Okay, so um, I want to make sure that we cover more of the stuff. Uh, so I talked a little bit about the idea of passive movement, all right? So um, practicing passive movement is um, fairly simple to do. Um, one of the things that you can do is just take each chord change and uh, maybe do it without the right hand. Let's say you uh, have, let me see, let's say this bar chord, an A major bar chord, and then let's say I play a D chord like this. So there's uh, no connection there between those two chords other than the fact that they both have a partial or full bar. Okay, so if I had those two chords uh, and I was gonna work on that in a piece, I would hold it, release, and then change the chord without shifting, shift, and there you go, okay? So whenever I practice a new piece, I always practice chord changes without the shift, and then I add the shift. And you'd be amazed. You know how you're like working on something and you shift and you miss it, right? Well, so uh, do whatever you're going to do, change that chord, shift, and you'll, you'll nail it every single time. Uh, uh, then um, another sort of rule, I keep getting away from this passive movement thing, but another rule to think about is that you never want to change your hand position when you shift. So what does it mean when you change your hand position? Well, basically it means that you've either rotated this way or this way. Okay, so if, now of course there are places where you can't avoid it, but um, how many of you have had students where they're playing a three octave scale and they get up to here and it's also like that, right? Okay, so you have to anticipate that. So you have to sit there and go like this so that it's a nice smooth movement. Basically, by the time I get to here, I'm already in the position that I need for this. So uh, you want to avoid hand position changes when you shift. That's a really big thing. Okay, so getting back to the passive movement. Um, I'm going to talk about the right hand. Um, on the right hand, there's two kinds of movements that's possible. One is alternating movement, right? When your fingers, I and M, go back and forth, okay? That, basically, that's active motion all the time, okay? There's ways of, of looking at it where you might sort of explore the idea of passive movement, uh, but uh, I'll get to that later. Then the other thing is you have um, movement where the fingers move in the same direction, okay? So that's sympathetic motion. Aaron Shear is the guy who sort of pioneered the, that concept. And uh, when you are looking at arpeggios, for example, uh, it's important to recognize uh, what you're doing. Uh, or even if you have a student, for example, or yourself, you're looking at your own playing and, and you're analyzing your IM uh, 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 um, uh, movement, uh, you wanna look at how precise your movement is going. Um, and for example, uh, I talk about, uh, with my students, about defining your stroke. What does defining your stroke mean? Well, if you're alternating I and M, you want to have the same forward and back movement for each finger. That is if you want the sound to be even, okay? Uh, very often you'll see people who have, usually if they have a lot of tension in the right half of their hand, um, maybe these fingers are kind of pulled out or they're sticking out like this, uh, or pulled in, they're sticking out. Uh, with those people, you'll see that their index finger tends to lift higher than the middle finger. So if you see this kind of a motion, uh, that means that they need work on a number of issues. One is relaxing their arm, and secondly, they need to practice defining their stroke, making sure that the forward and back motion for each stroke is the same. All right? Um, 
Then with arpeggios, it becomes more complicated because you're doing all sorts of combinations. Sometimes you have uh, uh, alternating motion. Sometimes you have sympathetic motion. Sometimes uh, you have pure, what I call pure sympathetic motion. Um, and uh, so there's a host of issues that you need to uh, explore there. Um, if you, if you like, uh, uh, make, a, make a fist or straighten up your, left, your right hand like this, and then let go. So now your hand's nice and relaxed. Now just pull your index finger slightly into the palm of your hand like you played a note. And what happens with the other fingers? For most, of the, for most of us, they move a little bit. My M finger tends to want to move with my index finger. Okay? So that's, that's the, uh, a passive mo motion opportunity for you. Okay, so one of the things that I often teach uh, to help people understand uh, how the right hand uh, movement should be is um, uh, what uh, you might call sweeps. And in fact, Bruce Holtzman, I think, is the guy who pioneered uh, this concept. Uh, and sadly, we lost Bruce a few weeks ago. Uh, and I never had a chance to talk to him about this. I wish I could have. But <clears throat> any rate, uh, um, so this is something, th the way I do this is something that I've developed on my own. And that is, um, when I have students who uh, uh, are learning to play arpeggios or trying to re refine their arpeggios, um, I often have them do uh, sort of light strum sweeps of the string. So let's say I have a student who's uh, working on something that just goes thumb, index, middle, ring. Okay? I would call that a pure sympathetic motion arpeggio. And what I'll do is I'll have them practice it like this. What they find is that when they, after they strum their thumb, I usually have them at first kind of just let go of their arm for a second uh, when they play the thumb just to release it. So I might have them pause like this. Then I'll have them go index, middle, ring, pulling the fingers into the palm of the hand. What they'll find is that after they play their index finger, their M finger invariably gets pulled to the string. That's passive motion. So I kind of have them do it like, like what you might call sympathetic, uh, sequential planting. And so I have them explore the idea of just letting their fing the, the successive fingers get pulled to the string in order. And that gives a beautiful flow to the way that they play the arpeggios. Yes? So when, when you're having them free flow, are, and you're talking about sequential planting, are you letting the finger just fly, or are you planting that finger that just played, or are you planting the next finger? Planting the next finger. So, so uh, that just finger just flying, and then um, the, the next finger gets planted as soon as it gets fired? Uh, if I understand you correctly. Sorry. You know, it's okay. <laughs> so it's M, M fires, and then, uh, I mean, I fires, and then M plants right away? Yes, yes. And, and what you want to do is you just want to let the M finger get pulled to the string right. on its own. And so you get this natural staccato. And the same string. Yeah. On the, so I'm so landing on the first right, string. Right, right, right. So it's all on one string. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I'm strumming. I, I tell them to not worry about what strings they strum. Uh, so, but I just generally tell them to you know, kind of loosely hit the bottom three strings with their thumb. And then the upper three strings with the fingers. I... And then I have them hold the finish and feel the natural tension in your forearm, then let go. And so when you let go, that's passive movement, right? And all of a sudden, your arpeggios just feel really nice and loose and, and comfortable. And then what I often have them do is segue into um, uh, playing uh, on two strings. So I'll have them go like this. And then I have them kind of gradually kind of work up to the second and first string. And I tell them I want their motion to be the same. I want them to have sort of what I call an ascending finger profile. This would be descending. So if I'm, ascend if I'm doing IMA, I want my index finger 
in front of my M, M in front of A. And then when you have passive motion, they just get pulled to the string. Okay? Now, um, uh, I teach tremolo uh, a number of different ways. And uh, if I have um, a young player, uh, like for example, this girl, Jennifer Kim, uh, I taught her tremolo on her 11th birthday. Yeah, uh, she had just turned 11. And her parents, she and her parents wanted to learn Una Limosna by Barrios. And so it's like, okay, well, let's practice tremolo. And so I, I did that uh, idea of the, the sweeps, except AMI. So I had her do that for a while. Then I had her put her uh, thumb on the second string and I had her put the fingers on the first string. And I had her go like this. Then relax the arm. Relax. And then we segued into. Yeah, so what I was doing um, was I was having the three fingers on the string. So you play the thumb on the second string, then the string is muted when you play your A finger, and then it's muted when you play your M finger, and then you get I. So then you get one note on the first string. But that's before you start. As you continue, then, the M and I plant when the thumb lands, after the thumb? Well, uh, you would only plant the thumb in the A finger. I mean, you could practice sequential planting. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, uh, Jennifer picked it up, uh, and I've had a couple other really young kids who, um, when I teach what I call full sympathetic tremolo, they do it beautifully. And so that's where they have their fingers kind of flared in a descending arpeggio shape, and they maintain that for the entire entirety of the piece. Uh, if you watch Jennifer play... Um, there's a couple of tremolo pieces that she did for GSI videos, uh, and they have some great views of her right hand. And uh, she has, I think, arguably one of the best tremolos in the world I've ever heard. Uh, and uh, it's physically easy for her. If she plays a concert, she often will play a tremolo piece as her first piece because that's the easiest thing for her to play, right? So uh, uh, she'll play in a limosna or in sueño in la floresta or something like that, and you scratch your head and you go, how could she do that? Well, it's easy for her. So most of us need to do a combination, and this kind of involves another uh, issue that I want to address. Uh, so uh, when you practice arpeggios, one of the things that you need to do is figure out where, if ever, there needs to be a switch or an alternation in. So a lot of people find that... Um, uh, playing tremolo uh, is best for them if they do a switch when they play their I finger. So when you play your I finger, that's when you kick out M and A. And so if you want to practice that, do that with sweeps. If you want, just do it without the thumb. Just leave your thumb in the sixth string and go A, M, and then switch. Relax. A, M, switch. Now if you watch the majority of uh, adult uh, or older guitarists who play tremolo well, you'll see that in the majority of them. Uh, it's only young kids that learn from an early age that seem to be able to adapt the full sympathetic uh, tremolo technique. For the rest of arpeggios, that's also super important, uh, the idea of figuring out where the switch is. So let's say you have a, a, a I, M, A, M, I arpeggio. So you want to have uh, sympathetic movement for the first two notes. And then your A finger is ready to play, and you need to have a switch. And if you think about this passive movement idea, the fact that I've pulled my I finger, that's an active motion. Then I just let my M finger get pulled to the string. I think of that as passive. Maybe that's a little bit uh, fantasy. But if I feel that way, if it feels loose and smooth and easy, then that's a nice thing. So I am switch. And then I have full sympathetic from A through I on the uh, final. So I go, I am, I'm going to pause. You see the profile of these fingers are back. Then I switch. 
when I switch, I just sort of kick out M and I, and I switch from this profile to this profile. Is that making sense? Okay, so with the right hand, every arpeggio pattern that you play, you need to figure out what kind of, you need to choreograph the movement. And so <clears throat> I've had enormous success with people who have had hand problems uh, in sort of troubleshooting their problems um, with sweeps. And uh, one of the, uh, the best uh, challenges is uh, the Villalobos Etude One. And it sounds kind of crazy, but I have them just play the pattern with sweeps. And then slowly, they, they get the feeling, the flow in their hand um, that feels smooth and easy. And then I have them transition to just, you know. Do it on single strings and then ultimately open strings. And one of the things that you figure out when you do the sweeps, uh, you sort of have to figure it out, is where you have the switch and where you have sympathetic movement. And um, the Villalobos etude is kind of interesting because, you know, if you watch lutenists play, what, are the, what do you always see? They always play really fast scales with their thumb and index fingers, right? Okay. And so um, it's a very uh, relaxed uh, combination. I think because the muscles just, I don't know, it just works. <laughs> uh, and so uh, the other thing I'll do with um, uh, the sweeps idea with people who are having issues with their technique is I'll have them uh, break it into groups of four. So I'll have them go one, E, and uh, and then shake out their arm. Maybe do head rolls, whatever they need to do with their shoulders, and then how's it go? Yeah, so uh, P, I, P, I, P, M. So I'll have them stop after the four sixteenths. And then relax. It's easier if you write it down. Then relax. Oh, I'm screwing it up. At any rate, so if you break it into groups of four and you shake out your arm and uh, practice each of those units a little bit, independent of the others. So what I'm saying is practice the first beat separately. Relax your arm. Practice the second beat in, uh, independently, the third beat and the fourth beat and you'll find that your movement is really uh, effortless. If you feel like your, your, your bicep and your deltoid muscles are tight, uh, stop. You need to shake those out. Uh, how are we doing time? Oh my god. Uh, we're just about out of time. Are the, um, I think I got the gist of what I wanted to present to you. Does anybody have any questions? A question or two? Yes? Repeated chords. Say it again? Repeated chords. Oh, man. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's tough. I know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the only thing I can suggest on that is um, uh, if you play, uh, let's say, a, th a three-note chord, thumb, index, and middle, and you just, uh, when you go back like this with your fingers, you follow through, and then you let go, your fingers do what? They go forward. They go back to the strings. So uh, with hand positions, I think of what we call, of what I call a uh, neutral position. So if you go like this with your left hand and you relax it and you put it up to the guitar, that's a perfect left hand position. Okay? Right hand. I have my students, usually I have them make a fist like this with the right hand uh, and they can feel all the muscles in their arm tighten up and I say, okay, let go and just touch the strings. Neutral position, perfect hand position. All the knuckles are nice and curved, profile of the fingers, almost always perfect, okay? And so when you uh, play a, um, a repeated chord, I wanna feel like, okay, I feel the follow through, and I'm just gonna let my fingers fall to the strings. That's not 100% of what you have to do, but that gets you started if you, if you are tight and you're trying to go, and you get your arm bouncing, you're in trouble. So, any other quick questions? I hope that helps. 
Okay, well, it's been uh, great talking to you today. Um, hope you enjoyed it.